So there we go. So if you wanted to find me later on, you can find me on Twitter at Julie Larkin305 or at jmpollardandandanderson.org. What I want to do is give you a brief um, work, uh, um, brief breakdown of what I'm going to discuss today. What's going on within physics in Texas? What's going on within the radiation history? Where have we been and where are we headed? What's going on with what's called now flash? And when did it start? As far as what is going on with flash today? And then what devices we utilize within radiotherapy in order to utilize flash radiotherapy? And then finally, what I see as the future of physics in Texas. Big disclaimer, please note that my institution, and especially my department, does have a contract with Mobitron. But don't worry, I'm not trying to sell you guys not one thing. I want you to know, if you haven't already been aware of, physics in Texas is as hot as Texas. How hot? Let's go back to a story that many of you, perhaps, especially those of you who are actual physics faculty and teachers, you might have been aware of. Raise your hand for those of you that happen to be in that large auditorium. If you are aware of how we, Texas, lost the world's largest super collider back in the early 1990s. Anyone aware of that? Just raise your hand. Let's make this interactive. Now, I want you to think about what we could have become. Between 1988 and 1993, the most in, in, uh, amazing idea from physicists was going to be realized in the Texas desert soil. It was going to cost as estimated to for completion almost $8.25 billion to build what would have been the world's largest super collider right here in our own backyard. But of course, due to politics and the way that people were behaving behind the scenes and deciding how they were going to prioritize the initiatives of America versus the international physics community, as a whole, those dynamics are what killed and sunk what could have put us in a new enlightenment age within physics in our very own backyard. How big was the super collider going to be? I want you to understand the world's largest super collider that we have right now, the Large Hadron Collider, is only on order of 27 kilometers. And the time that it was being hypothesized and being built and constructed, our super collider in Texas would have been 87 kilometers. Please understand the difference. And then the total cost was going to eclipse perhaps double what the, the current Large Hadron Collider cost um, to be built and to run. I want you to understand, had we had physicists with enough vision as well as political acumen, we could be in a whole different situation today. And I want you to understand, our heyday has returned physicists. I want you to know now is the time to think larger again, but also not just think about Texas. I need us to do what we wouldn't do in the 1980s during the Reagan administration and then later on in the Bill Clinton administration. We need to think globally. Why? Because we're being left behind. I want you to understand physicists come to arms, start to work together to decide what is the next big idea, next big agenda item that we want to tackle to help put our, um, our ideas in front of the world in a way that is understood by the common people so that they also have a desire to work with us on it. And I actually have something that I believe that physicists are going to be excited about, which I'll call flash, and you'll get to be understand it better, and why I think now is the time to help to identify why it works, how it works, and then move it forward into the clinics all across the world. Please note that CERN right now, they're not satisfied just with their LHC. They, in fact, now want to eclipse what we were going to do with our super collider in Texas and build a new super collider that's going to be in the order of $23 billion and be 100 kilometers long. It is time to think of what we can do to work with them and champion this idea and to make it a true world effort. What's going on in Texas? We're getting lots of money for different types of astrophysics types of um, experimentation, as well as for projects that are being thought up by Texas physicists, such as the wonderful Dr. Romano. Not to be outdone, we have a number of notable up and rising physicist faculty, especially at the Texas Tech University who are receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars for their awards from New Horizons Physics um, Society. And then, notably, some of you physics teachers in our high schools here in Texas, please realize the wonderful leaps and bounds that you are um, enjoying as you try to bring quantum physics 
into the classroom at the high school level. I wish that this had been done about 20 years ago for yours truly. And then we have some of the most interesting looking students as well as the most fun times you can imagine having, um, as you can see depicted by this wonderful class or cohort of physics students from the Texas Tech University. So let's talk about radiation therapy. We understand that physics is hot and cool within Texas, but what's going on with radiation therapy and why should you care? 1895 is when we actually began to have the age of radiation therapy come alive. It was this one x-ray that actually began the start of our particular profession. This 1895 x-ray of Wilhelm Rankin's wife's hand, which is famous for our field. Not to be outdone, 1896, the wonderful, <clears throat> and most famous woman scientist began doing a lot of work on radium alongside her husband and even was the only physicist or scientist in the history of the world to receive not just one, but two Nobel prizes and two separate specialties. She is uh, um, the mother of our field. Now, in the early 1900s, right after 1896 and 1898, please note that the entire world was in a frenzy and excited about what radiation can do. And I'm telling you now, Flash is gonna to help to bring that back. We utilized radiation back in the early 1900s for a number of reasons that we should have never done, such as utilizing x-ray exposure to remove excess hair from people's chins, as well as to um, deal with headaches. And then of course, as early as 1896, the handlers of our x-ray generators, you'll know, started to have these untoward effects of excess radiation exposure. And this is what caused for a lot of the government agencies that you enjoy today to have been put into place to help to make sure that we are utilizing radiation in a proper manner. 1951, we started to realize if we want to give radiation therapy, we need to be aware where we're giving it to. The idea of localization, targeting to a specific, um, to the specific spot and only treating the cancerous area versus protecting normal cells came alive. And as you can see depicted here in this Canadian stamp, the idea of having an x-ray generator that treats the patient, but also has an x-ray imager on the same line of sight as that particular generator. So we had a progression in radiation therapy. We have an intent of what we want to treat, something that's very detailed and very difficult to, um, to map. But then we start off with rudimentary techniques like we had in the early 1900s, utilizing very poorly shaped and ill-defined beam arrangements, such as four field boxes. Then we moved on to conformal radiation therapy, which gave us a little bit of ability to um, conform the beam at depth. And then 3D conformal radiation therapy and final in, um, IG, IMRT, the age that we are in now. The imaging that we utilize for radiation therapy has jumped in leaps and bounds, where now we actually have MRI scanners attached to linear accelerators, known as MR Linux, which gives image quality like what you see depicted on this screen here from the Atlantic, which we have here at MD Anderson Cancer Center. So we've moved quite a far away from the 1956 um, types of linear accelerators to what's now being hypothesized as phasers by the wonderful Dr. Billy Liu, who is leading the effort in the United States on flash radiotherapy that I'll describe later. So flash, this is a topic that I have been connected to ever since my talk back in 2019 in San Antonio for our annual American Association of Physicists and Medicines meeting. I am standing next to my um, division head who is to my left in this picture. And then also you have the wonderful Dr. Liu who came up that phaser Linac that I showed you before. Let me go back, showed you before, as well as Lei Dong who works on proton flash radiotherapy. Once that um, session happened, the whole entire medical physics community came into an uproar and tried to decide how we felt, whether or not we thought this is something that's gonna be everlasting, this flash, or is it just gonna be a flash in the pan? I want you physicists to know that either way, this is the topic at hand and that you should care about if you give any inkling about cancer research and medical physics. Now, why is this so exciting? Why are, you, why are we even trying to understand this as a community of physicists in the medical physics community? Well, it's all due to this thing called Hofusen's hypothesis, where I want you to understand, simply put, we're trying to ex uh, exacerbate the difference between tumor control probability, the likelihood of um, killing a tumor cell versus the actual normal tissue complications. And that happens to be that golden spot underneath the curve depicted here. This is what flash exacerbates and expands and allows us to treat in a way we've never had before. 
Let me tell you more. So Flash was really brought to the forefront, especially in 2017, at Lausanne University Hospital, which is not too far, surprisingly, from CERN. But it shouldn't be shocking to you. Why? Because high energy physics research yields itself to amazing radiotherapy um, marvels and techniques. So from that particular institution, they came up with data that shocked the entire medical community, not just medical physics, oncologists had to stop and look at this as well. This chart shows you something very surprising. On the red curve, you see what happens when you deliver treatment to a mouse that has, um, that has um, a lung tumor or just is being irradiated in its lung and given a, a conventional dose rate of 1.8 gray per minute. What you'll notice is that the ability to receive pulmonary fibrosis over a period of time increases rapidly if you give it in conventional dose rate, as you would expect in a normal mouse. Now, if you rate the same lung in the same type of mice, but exacerbate that, um, that dose rate, increase it up markedly 200 times or more, what you'll realize is that you can confer 70% or more protection to that mouse that actually receives ultra high dose rate radiotherapy. And that's what we're calling flash effect. By increasing one parameter and the way that you deliver radiotherapy, increasing the dose rate to a crazy warp speed if you wanna go ahead and get Star Trek on me. That's how you can confer protection to normal cells. How long have we been um, identifying this effect? Believe it or not, since 1959, it was hypothesized back then by Dewey and Bogue that if you reduce oxygen in the area of where you're trying to treat, that increasing the um, dose rate can help to spare particular bacteria in those settings. 1971, we did even more high dose rate experience and noticed that that causes hypoxia and protection in normal cells. And then in 2014, Lausanne brought it home by showing by treating with 40 gray per second or more dose rates, you can see a differential response between tumor, normal and tumor tissue in mice. What does this look like? Some of you guys may have never done a biological experiment, but you'll be able to understand this chart. What I want you to understand, the first column, the zero grade column, which means they receive no dose, as in zero grade radiation. That's the sham group. So that's the first column shown closer to the B. Then you have the 15 grade conventional dose rate group shown in the middle. And then finally, the last column of, um, of mice, you'll notice happens to be the 28 gray flash ultra high dose rate radiotherapy group. What you'll notice is that on the column number one, this is eight days post that irradiation, whether it was zero gray, 15 gray conventionally given, or 28 gray and flash rate. What you'll notice as days pass on, after you hit day 35, those mice that actually had an orthotomic log, lung tumor implanted into, their, um, into them, what you realize they are dead if they don't get any radiation therapy. The 15 gray conventional group, only two survive after day 35 and the day 62. But the flash group, this is that differential response that I want you to understand. Not only are they tumor bearing mice, that receive this flash radiotherapy. They actually have the clearing up of that tumor and they survive. Who's left standing? The flash group. This is what we want to see in human patients. And this is why oncology is really trying to understand how real this effect is and how to translate it as soon as possible into a clinic near you and your loved ones. What does this look like in other models? So here's a, mount, uh, a pig that was actually rated on one side with conventional dose rate radiation therapy for 20 gray shots and along the side of it versus the 300 gray per second flash ultra high dose rate. What you'll notice is that you either have necrosis or you don't. That is the difference that we're seeing with flash radiation. Also, if you were to irradiate a mouse's entire abdomen with this confidential under revision work that was done by the Dr. Liu who I told you before, note that his mice, after receiving conventional dose rate radiation for 16 grades of their whole abdomen, they died after 10 days post that radiation. But the flash group lived on. So what is flash? It's the use of ultra fast delivery of radiotherapy at dose rates generally several thousand times higher than those used currently in routine clinical practice, meaning over 40 grade per second <clears throat> for flash radiotherapy. And the effect, the flash effect, that happens to be the phenomenon of the increased therapeutic index of flash compared to conventional dose rate irradiation or protection of normal cells just by increasing the dose rate. 
what systems are around that actually get to these types of high dose rates that we've been utilizing to see flash effects. Lausanne at um, Lausanne University, Stanford University here in the United States, Secontron at Grenoble, as well as the 100 um, MEV protons that we have at Curie, um, as well as UPenn. We can also manipulate and change the um, parameters and settings for traditional linear accelerators used in radiotherapy clinics like my own. This is a system that we utilize both at Stanford as well as MD Anderson that has been utilized to investigate flash effects. And also we have other types of linear accelerators made by Alexa, another big name in the industry that we can also be utilized for delivering dose rates under a special setting for over 200 grade per second. We also have commercial electron flash systems that have now been made only for studying flash, such as the Ariatron that has been pioneered, especially by the Lausanne group. And now the Mobitron, a very new unit that's being utilized not just to deliver flash radiotherapy in just the traditional external beam setting for um, intact skin treatments and so forth. It's also meant to be utilized for what we call intraoperative radiotherapy, where you actually open the patient up to expose the deep-seated tumor and deliver the flash radiotherapy directly to the tumor. Why? Because we're using electron beams and they only penetrate so far through tissue. Therefore, if you're able to do it intraoperatively, you can reach deep-seated lesions and still maintain that flash effect. So what type of dissimilars do we utilize in order to describe and characterize this effect? There's a whole range of them that we utilize for these experiments, going all the way from TLDs, ionization chambers, diamond diodes, alanine pellets, gel dosimeters, and et cetera. What mediates this? Now that's something that's gonna be worth the next Nobel Prize. We aren't sure. Why are normal tissues acting differently than tumor tissues when they're exposed to flash radiotherapy? We think that it could be affecting something in the acute phase and dealing with the um, misregulation of the reactive oxygen species that uprises as you deliver at conventional slow dose rate speeds, but it's circumvented when you actually deliver it in ultra high dose rate flash. But the benefits in specific models in mice and other types of animals is quite convincing on the order of either 13% protection seen in mouse intestine all the way to 80% in lung, mouse lung. So the mechanism of action, a group such as Spitz et al. has suspected that flash may convert all of its endogenous oxygen into reactive oxygen species and tissues, but this gets handled preferentially better by our normal tissues compared to the tumor because they have better antioxidant pathways. Bozen et al. from Lausanne, they suggest that there's transient hypoxia initiated by flash ultra high dose rate radiotherapy that causes bursts of free radicals trapping oxygen, and that confers radio resistance in our normal tissues. And so the differential oxygen tensions between normal and tumor cells and those differences in DNA damage create what we call flash effects. There's challenges in delivering this. This is not very straightforward. Hence, we need the scientific community to all lean in to help us to identify what's going on here. There are very few systems that are available to deliver this flash radiotherapy. Remember, my list was not too long or comprehensive. Treating deep-seated tumors, especially with electron beams, isn't really a, a, a good deal. And we have to make sure that we have something that would allow for us to have flash, but for treating deep seated lesions. So we're investigating very high energy electrons or flash X-ray or photon beams, or, and also flash protons. There's very little data on flash multi, um, multi-fractionated treatments, and we do multi-fraction treatments for normal patients in the clinic now to protect normal tissue because you can't deliver the high amount of doses that we deliver to patients for clearing their tumors all in one shot. But that's the only way that flash has been studied thus far. We need to have sophisticated dose monitoring for delivering a flash, similar to those in high energy physics labs. And also we need to figure out a paradigm for patient safety when the whole treatment can be delivered in literally half a second. Flash is a very unique and interesting animal. But still, for all the reasons that I've already shown, I still consider it to have been a cancer breakthrough since for 2020. We already have from Lausanne the first human case report that came out in 2019, where a man, a 75-year-old man with cutaneous T-cell lymphoma had those particular lesions that were irradiated with flash actually clear up and be healed. So flash treatment times are economically and logistically beneficial to our clinics. There's a reduced number of overall fractions necessary in order to produce flash effects and provide better quality of life for these patients that have no other out, um, another um, type of treatment available to them. 
Already, I want you to understand that within the radiation therapy community, there is consortia that have created in order for those people who have particular proton beams that are made by um, varying known as the pro beam that are coming together to collect and collate their data that they're going to have on flash experiments that they're hosting right now. But that's not it. I want you now to consider the Jurassic Park effect. Any of you guys who grew up in the early 1990s, much like myself, you know that Jeff Goldblum's character really for, um, throughout the film brought the, the idea of could versus should. Just because we can do something as scientists doesn't mean that we should. And because that flash still has so many different unknowns as far as the long-term effects on, on a particular animal and or human, we have to think about how to do this in a nice um, perspective manner that allows for safety to still be maintained. But I must admit, the idea of 80% protection in the lung is something that many of us just can't ignore. Already, I want you to know that in at UPenn already, at Penn, they have a flash a clinical trial that they actually are already engaging in with the clinical dog treatments that they have, where they're treating dogs that have different types of osteosarcomas and other types of tumors, and they're treating them with flash radiotherapy to get a, a host of data that we haven't had beforehand. Also, they're considering in Ohio State to have Nationwide Children's Hospital offer the first flash proton therapy, not for adults, but for our children. Children's tumors most likely are treated with proton therapy in order to utilize the, um, the beneficial effects of proton, which has a beautiful stopping power and that changes directly at the end of its range, which allows for you to protect any normal tissues just on the distal end of the tumor that you're treating. Hence why we give it to, especially those people who are expected to live a long time, such as our children. So the idea of combining flash with proton therapy for our children was something they couldn't pass up. And we already have that clinical trial and that ability to treat them being opened up at nationwide children. Partially slowed down by the pandemic, but I do believe that they are still underway. So don't forget that Cincinnati Children's and UC Health Proton Therapy Center are also announcing their first patient treated and the FASTA-1 first human clinical trial of flash therapy for cancer for adults. So there's multiple trials within the United States of America that are going on right now as we speak investigating flash, not just in dogs and mice and pigs, but now also in humans and in, and in, in this time, children as well. So this is why I'm telling you, the time for physics innovation is now. And I believe that our state and our children need to know if you wanna train in physics and you wanna see the future of where the field, whether it be in medical physics or be in astrophysics or anything else, it is to be here in Texas, we are ready. Why do I say this? Because for a fun reason, you should already know the billionaires are coming. They're already here throwing their billions around and using up all the wonderful tax incentives that the various communities in Texas are giving them, such as the wonderful Elon Musk, who's going and doing so much with his SpaceX program. Note that especially within Austin and Travis County, they are giving sometimes in the order of 60 million tax breaks to these different organizations to bring in their companies to us. We have revenue, we have money here that we've never had before. And the type of industry that we have now far eclipses whatever we had in the 1980s, which allowed for us to think of our super collider back then. So please note, it's time for savvy physicists forward-thinking physicists to come up with a cohesive plan and manipulate what we have available to us for the betterment of humankind. If you haven't noticed, there's something called TMC3 being built literally in my backyard right here in Houston, which is not too far from where you guys are as well. And it's going to be the expansion of the Texas Medical Center, which is the, actually the largest medical center in the entire world. How many of you guys in that room have heard of TMC3? No hand, raise hands. That scares me. Watch, ladies and gentlemen. Do you hear it? The Texas Medical Center Good. treats more patients and conducts more research than anywhere else in the world. A city unto itself. The TMC has over 8 million patient visits a year in 50 million square feet of clinical and research facilities. And now, the Texas Medical Center is building a translational research campus, the TMC3. This innovative life science cluster will be the new nerve center for collaboration, 
to improve the health of humanity. Life-saving medical breakthroughs can only happen at the intersection of patients, doctors, scientists, and industry partners. The TMCT will leverage shared core laboratories to co-locate the best institutions and brightest minds to accelerate collaboration. The central piazza is the heart of the iconic double helix, surrounded by over a million square feet of shared laboratory space, creating an immersive environment to attract and nurture the best talent in the world. The campus will create alliances between institutions and commercial partners to catalyze the development of new drugs, medical devices, and digital health breakthroughs. This live, work, and play ecosystem will foster interactions inside and outside of the laboratory. Walkable green space and exercise facilities will improve mind, body, and spirit not only for our researchers, but for the community as well. So I wanted you to have that teaser. This is not a joke. This is actually already well underway. And hopefully within the next five to 10 years, we'll really open up and be available for your students, if not yourselves, to enjoy and to partake in the global theater of science. I want you to understand, we are now in a very new era within Houston, within Texas, within science as a whole and medicine, where we're going to attract the world's best and brightest to tackle the biggest problems that we face as a human, as a humankind. And so I feel that especially with these wonderful innovations that we're working on, such as flash radiotherapy and a number of other things, once we come together, we can help solve one of the biggest issues of our lifetime, such as cancer and a number of other medical um, issues. I do believe it is time for physicists to think just as big as we used to back in the early to late 1980s to um, early 1990s. This is the time to think like TMC3. And this is something that's actually taken a part of the pillars of my particular division and um, in the Anderson Cancer Center. We're looking at flash radiotherapy and that's gonna be part of that TMC3. We are already there, already have almost three different mechanisms that we're utilizing in order to deliver flash. Whether it be flash proton, we have that up and running. We have um, the uh, Mobitron as well. And we're working on the very high energy electron ability of delivering flash. These are three different techniques that will be part of TMC3, but I don't feel like that's the end of the story. I do believe that the students, the trainees, that the other physicists that you guys are connected to could help us think of even more um, therapeutics and other ideas that are going to advance healthcare in a way that we've never imagined before. Also, what I want to say, and I can't not say this, as somebody who is a large proponent for ed, um, equity, diversity, and inclusion within STEM, and especially within medical physics, since I chair almost everything in an AAPM that is related to it, such as the actual um, <clears throat> the committee on equity, diversity, and inclusion within AAPM, I want you to know and to tell your students and your trainees and anyone that you come across that wanted to get into medical physics that now is the time to join, not just because we're working on innovative things such as flash radiotherapy, but because we're becoming more inclusive. Of all people and people from all different kinds of backgrounds regardless of how you identify notably one thing that you should realize is that for our graduate students and our trainees 42 percent of our medical physics phd students were women in 2017 and have been going from 42 percent to about 36 percent ever since in our field this is a doubling of what you see in pure physics there is something unique about when you start to ask people to apply uh, physics to medical problems, the ideas that come through, the people that it attracts, and the innovation that then comes from it is so amazing. I want you to be aware of this burgeoning field, and I want you to see even your potential part in either helping to recruit people to it or just allowing people to know. But please understand that the gender equity issues that we have in pure physics as a whole actually can be somewhat dealt with if we start to identify how we can actually present physics in a way such that everyone understands that there is a place for all. And by seeing the wonderful number of women and, um, and other diverse 
uh, people from diverse backgrounds within my field and exposing them to the outside physicists, that can change the narrative of who we think a physicist will become and how we actually train and teach the students that we see every single day when they come into our classrooms. We need to take our own lenses off and start to realize that everyone has a part in changing the outcome of what the next generation of physicists looks like. And we can actually make sure everyone is aware that there is a new genre of physics readily available, asking to be even more inclusive and to provide an, out, an avenue for research to any of your trainees, as well as yourself. I can't um, go without saying that this whole entire talk covered a lot of different things are worked on by a, by a large group of people. It definitely takes a village, especially my team that I lead at MD Anderson Cancer Center. I would, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention their names and especially the new lead physicist at my center for flash radiotherapy, the last name on that list, Dr. Emil Schuler, who came from Stanford University, which was the first American university to actually show the flash effect on our soil. I want to say thank you to all the organizers. Thank you for your attention, for your time. And once again, if you would like what I said, or you have any questions, or you just want to follow me, you can find me at Julie Larkin 305, or you can email me the traditional way at jmpollardofmganderson.org. Thank you so much for your time. And now I'll just open up if there is extra time for any questions or any comments. Thank you yeah. all. Um. Thank you, Dr. Pollard Larkin. Um, unfortunately, we need to uh, move on to the next plenary speaker. Uh, I, I'm hoping that everybody here will take advantage of this and email you any questions, because I know that was a great talk and I'm, I'm sure everybody, uh, it, there's gotta be a lot of good questions coming out of that. So thank you very much again for that talk. Thank you. It was a pleasure. You guys enjoy the rest of your day. All right.